everybody. Okay, full disclosure, uh, I love these health summits, but I searched high and low for a cookie. I can't help it. So I know I need to change my behavior. And here's the second thing. What's with this weather? I mean, right? I came from the East Coast. I'm like, oh, I'm going to San Diego, and it's colder here. So even in these rooms, it's really cold. So I am really thrilled to be in a room with public health um, officials because parks are on the front line of communities that are not healthy. So I want to talk today about underserved communities. And I love all the strategies and the recommendations that we've heard, but most of them won't work in underserved communities. They just don't have that access and they don't have the opportunities. So when I talk about what I do, two things come up. They say, oh God, you must have so much fun. I do have fun, but it's not like every day I'm out in a park. And the second thing is they want me, they want to know if I know Amy Puller. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have met her. Uh, in fact, she did come out to one of the recreation centers with uh, Obama, uh, Michelle Obama, and they did do a spoof, but no, we are nothing like that show. Um, but it is hard when I talk about parks and recreation and what we do do, because we do so many things. In fact, most of you probably had some experience as a kid or maybe with your children. Maybe you sent them to camp, maybe you went to camp, maybe you took a yoga class, maybe you attended a concert. So the problem with parks and recreation is you go down this rabbit hole trying to explain what we do. So we decided to put a video together. And so with that, I'm going to share a video that kind of explains what we do. I know growing up, um, I love going to my neighborhood park, um, especially for those of us who didn't grow up with a lot of money and you couldn't afford a lot of the specialty activities. Having something like a park that anybody could go into and whether it's take a walk or play a game of tag, if your local park had a pool and you could swim, you know, there was just so many different things that offer such a wide variety of services to everyone. I think I'm pretty old for this, but I like the splash plays, like, especially with my brother and like my friends. I like to bring him because I like to get him um, away from playing video games so much. NRPA came together in 1965. The association was really founded on the principle that there needed to be a place where everybody could play. We're not just providing playgrounds or places to play or a swimming lesson or a class. We're making a difference in the lives of a generation and impacting communities everywhere we are. So our pillars were really the main focus that started this foundation. These three pillars, health and wellness, conservation, and social equity, are a constant reminder to agencies to look at a balance in what they offer. Social equity, I think, is the pillar that resonates most with uh, me and I think a lot of other people. And uh, I think the reason for that is, you know, public open spaces is one of the last or only place really where people of all walks of life can come together and they're on equal footing. We look at an increasingly diverse and growing country. Our demographics are changing. As agencies focus on social equity, it's this diversity that's gonna make us richer as a profession and impact even more lives as we go forward. The health and wellness pillar, um, that's been kind of our, our mantra from day one. We've always thought of parks and recreation as, as kind of a key to health and wellness. Having parks increases the quality of my life by a great measure. The third pillar is conservation. We recognize that parks, open space, that we have to conserve it, and we also have to introduce people to the love of nature. We have to make sure that we're playing a key role, not just in, in maintaining what we have, but in rebuilding what we've had that maybe we have lost, and then most importantly, in educating our youth and our, our communities around why this is important. The children who will take over the stewardship of the parks and of the earth need to understand the full value of what parks create. just does baseball and football. 
We are really social service centers where we're providing cooking and nutrition, physical education, where we are providing after-school daycare. We are providing the, the mentorship that they may not get at home. So one of the things that NRPA looks at is how do we bring those services or those assets to underserved communities? This organization has grown and gotten stronger. We need to have the courage to try new thinking, to try new ways of doing things, and not see it as we're abandoning the old ways, but see it as we are innovators in our own right. And that's what's gonna bring us the next 50 years of success. So, I realize I hate that video and I'm never showing it again because you don't see the parks that I see. I was in Baltimore just a couple of weeks ago, and I'm sorry if anybody's from Baltimore, I'm really not picking on you because it could be any city. But this park was not far from Johns Hopkins, which is kind of ironic, right? The medium income for this community was $25,000, and 90% of the households were led by women. There were no grocery stores that these people could access. The park that we were looking at was literally on the corner of a, an intersection of four lanes of traffic. When you walked into the park, I swear, I didn't even recognize this rec center. I thought it was a cave. It had gang symbol, symbols all over it. There were no windows. I mean, it was bad. And then you walked into the playground area. There was one swing, one swing. And those are the parks that we're dealing with. So we can talk about that one out of three people have a park in walking distance. I guarantee you in underserved communities that isn't the case. So I don't mean to be Debbie Downer, but I would hope that all of you, when you consider your strategies, you consider your marketing, don't forget those parks. We do have common goals with you. We work to prevent disease and pr to promote health. And we have some funders in the audience, so I want to thank you. And before I get into what our programs are, they're all evidence-based, because I know funders want that evidence-based programming. So, obesity and diabetes. What you may not know about Parks and Recreation is behind schools, we are the largest provider of meals to children. So we have a tremendous opportunity to impact their nutrition and their physical activity, and boy do we. We've got a program that is independently monitored to make sure that we are providing the best education we can. And guess what? Those kids go back to their home and they're teaching their family. Okay. So arthritis is a very big uh, issue, and those of you who are in the health industry, you know that, I don't have to tell you. But baby boomers are the largest uh, population that are using parks. The other thing is, the average retirement fund that these people have is $20,000. So to think that baby boomers have this um, expendable income to visit fitness centers, it just isn't so. So we have a program called Walk With Ease. It's low impact. But the other thing is it allows these senior citizens to get together. And there are so many programs that we offer them. I went into a senior center. They had popcorn, they had bridge going on, they were cooking, they were dancing. It was a dating scene on steroids. <laughs> so here's the thing I think is going to be the biggest issue as we go forward, and it's mental health. We talked a lot about addiction and loneliness and wired kids and stress. Our open space parks are a rem rem remedy to all of that. But it's not all rosy. Building a sense of community takes work and it takes funds. And there's lots of programs that do that. But the reality is when you are in an underserved community, you are working with parks where it's not even safe to go to them. So building that sense of community for a population that needs it more than ever is really tough. We are on the front line of all societal issues, including the homeless. Depending on, on the political atmosphere of a municipal or a city, either homeless are treated very well and the rec centers will take their 
uh, belongings and store it for them so they can go to a job interview or they are moved out. But the reality is probably 99.9% .9 of homeless are either mentally ill or they have an addiction problem. Addiction, yes. So we go to parks and we clean them out and we move hundreds of thousands of needles. But the thing that's happening now with our rec centers is there are people are being trained on how to use Narcan. And so some of you might say, well, that's mission creep. These people should just be offering recreation services. The reality is we're on the front line. We don't have a choice. Infectious diseases. For those of you that are in San Diego will know that we've had deaths in these parks because of Hep A. Those diseases do not, they impact everybody. So if you sit on a park bench and if you don't have Hep A, you still pick it up. It lives forever and that's how the deaths occur. So what did the park agencies do? They provided hygiene. They opened their bathrooms to people that had Hep A. They brought doctors in to immunize these people. Again, we are on the front line. And let's not forget vector diseases. One of the things you're going to hear about in parks is green infrastructures. That's using nature to clean water and clean the air, which is paramount to public health. I haven't heard that a lot today, but you talk about cleaning the air, you talk about asthma, you have to have open space, you have to have trees. Green infrastructure serves two things. It provides recreation opportunities and it also moves that water. This is in a park in Atlanta. It's Fourth Ward. And it was a, oh, it was just a swamp. And so they built a retention, a water retention basis. And it was for a hundred year storm. In other words, it would withstand a storm that would probably only come every hundred years. Literally, after they built this park, a storm came and it was up to the top. So the water can rise and the park is still taken care of. Here's what I'm most excited about. This is a recreation center or community center that's in the lower ninth ward of New Orleans. It's called the Sanchez Center. This community is literally steps away from where the levee broke. The good news is they got FEMA money. And the park director didn't just build it and say, oh, this is what we're gonna do. He went out into the community and said, what do you want and what do you need? Engaging that community was paramount. He built a center that I had heard about, oh, you've gotta see this, it's so cool. And I was so disappointed when we drove up. It looked like a, a bunker, it was just a cement box. The God, you got all this FEMA money and this is what you built? But the beauty was when you walked in, it literally had a health clinic and it had a recreation center and it had a senior center and it had a music studio and it had police. The health clinic provided prenatal care. And if these women went to the classes, they got certain points. And if they got enough points, they went downstairs and redeemed them and they could buy a stroller or a breast pump. That is the future. And we are working with a very vulnerable population and we're Parks and Rec. We're a community center and we are social service providers. So when you think of us, think bigger, think bigger. Our reach, we have 100,000 parks and those are local public parks. We are in neighborhoods. Some of them are huge and some of them are little pocket parks. There's over 12,000 park and recreation agencies. An agency can support 50 rec centers or hundreds of parks. So while there's only 12,000, we are literally in every single community. So if you have a public health issue, talk to us. We can help you. There's trust with the park and recreation department and the citizens within that community. I'll give you an example. You know the uh, marketing campaign when you say it's got milk and they had all the celebrities? They spent a zillion dollars on that campaign. The reality is milk, consum milk consumption went down. It was a national campaign that they threw a lot of money at. In New Orleans, they could not get the women to breastfeed. 
So they went out into the community and they said, what's, what's going on? And in that specific community, breastfeeding was associated with poor people. So they launched a campaign in their little rec center and it had women that looked like them. And guess what? That went up, breastfeeding went up. So it's knowing our residents and especially in underserved communities. I was supposed to talk about cross collaboration with different departments. I'd like to tell you the park and recreation agencies work with the planners. It's just not so. And we don't work with our public health officers either. And I take responsibility for that, but I'm gonna ask you, please ask us to come to the table because if we're used properly, we could be an army that could really change this country. Thank you very much.